What people in Tahrir Square have in mind is what we call in Arabic Fasil al-Sulutat, which means you don't have the monopoly of power in one hand. From the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University, you're listening to Dewaniya. Egypt is once again beset by rioting and calls for a new government. It started as a protest against the death sentences handed down to 21 men involved in a riot in which 74 people were killed. None of those sentenced were members of the security forces, which had been proven complicit in the violence. This injustice came only days before the second anniversary of the January 25th revolution. It has only been about a month since the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party pushed through the new constitution, itself an object of criticism for its failure to guarantee certain basic human rights. And last week, in a move disturbingly reminiscent of the Mubarak era, President Morsi declared a state of emergency in Ismailia, Suez, and Port Said. This is Diwania, I'm Shoshi Shmulevitz, and here to discuss Egypt's prospects for democracy is Uzi Rabi, director of the Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies and head of the Department of Middle Eastern History at Tel Aviv University. How is President Morsi navigating this situation? I think that uh, Morsi goes on with his own strategy to turn Egypt into something that goes in accordance with the agenda of the Muslim brothers. But what we have seen, and I think that this would be one of the main points of what we call the Arab Spring, barriers of fear collapsed, the equation between rulers and ruled is being changed here, and the people being gathered once again in Tahrir Square This tells us that this is a part of the new political game in Egypt and in the Middle East as Egypt is definitely constitutes a barometer of the political climate in the Middle East. Morsi has won. Muslim brothers have won. But it's not a full victory. Morsi is squeezed in, being caught up between two different forces in Egypt. Generally speaking, we have the liberal camp the Islamist camp, even though he is part and parcel of the Islamist camp, he is still being urged by people coming from the Salafi movements, from the Muslim brothers, to forge a vision for Egypt, which goes in line with the political Islam. At the same time, he is being pressured by many in Egypt, in the liberal bloc, which is comprised of media, businessmen, most people in Cairo, And I think that uh, this thing has to be taken into account. This is not a one-man company anymore, states in the Middle East. What we are yet to be seen is whether Morsi would go with a harsh attitude toward the protesters to be pushed by the Muslim brothers to be much more assertive and create an Egypt that would be similar to what we think of when we think about the Islamic Republic. Or he would come up with something which is much more appeasing to build up dialogue, to provide Egypt a relative lull or calm, because this is what Egypt needs. Egypt is in a pretty bad situation, economically speaking. Without dealing with that, constitution, parliament, revolution, it doesn't matter. So Morsi uh, has a lot to deal with. What kind of a precedent is Egypt setting for the other Arab Spring states? Egypt is a barometer, had been always a barometer in the Middle East when it comes to the main processes. I think that what we could glean from Egypt is some insights and themes. We definitely could uh, find them in other states that had experienced the Arab Spring or those who haven't yet experienced the Arab Spring. For example, when I said that the barriers of fear collapsed, this is something that we have seen in recent weeks. And we know that when it comes to the public, when it comes to the equation of rulers-ruled relationships, this is something totally different from what we used to have in Mubarak's era. This goes also to Tunisia. You can see that also in some other monarchies in the Middle East when the monarch is trying to appease the public. I won't say that this is the rule when it comes to failed states like Libya or Syria or Yemen, because the game there is being played in a different way. But definitely, this is one thing to be taken into account. 
And if we would like to better understand or analyze the political process here, we have to map out the forces of the political scene here. First and foremost, Egypt is an example, an arena of an ongoing political confrontation, because in Egypt, I think that what we have managed to hear these days is a plethora of voices and orientations, socialists, liberals, Marxists, Islamists, and others. Basically, this is an ongoing process. It's not the end of it. It's just the beginning. We have reached a point when we can say no more actually one-man show. What is being proved by what we do see in Egypt is that while deposing a dictator, this is not to say that you're going to get democracy the day after. This is the long and very, very painful process of acquiring a different political culture and getting closer to something that uh, makes the people feel as if they have a say here. It would take a lot of time. We are just in the early stages of that. And Morsi will have to learn that democracy is uh, something by which to better listen to other voices, not necessarily to the dominant one. This is something that the Muslim brothers do not internalize. What they think is that uh, after having won the elections, they think that they could take the state and turn it into something that goes strictly in line with their own agenda. It's democracy, and you have to pay attention to the other voices or the minorities. And it is really, really interesting to see how Morsi will play the cards here. So in light of that, do you think that the new constitution will be a real step towards democracy? I think it's a step to democracy, but democracy is, uh, at least at this stage, is a far-fetched idea. It's, It's kind of a power test, I would say. Morsi is trying to provide constitution, to provide a parliament, but at the same time to say there is something on top of that, which is a president. This is not acceptable. What people in Tahrir Square have in mind is what we call in Arabic Fasil al-Sulutat, which means you don't have the power or monopoly of power in one hand. You have to break it up to pieces and uh, we have to have checks and balances here. What this constitution provides, Morsi, is kind of a monopoly on the power in Egypt. What is most important here is that a ruler is being challenged by the public on having a constitution which does not fulfill actually the aspirations of democracy in the people at large. So you've mentioned that Morsi is caught between the liberal bloc and the Islamist bloc. What happens if he fails to appease both sides? If he fails, Egypt is going to experience a chronic chapter of instability. This is the most, uh, I think, a most acute damage to Egypt's future survival as a stable economic field and political field. What would this mean for the region? I think that for the region, it would mean that uh, in the coming decades, what the Middle East would experience is what we call post-revolutionary fluctuations. There was a tumultuous change here, a real drama. But still, we have to wait and see how long it would take to Morsi, if at all to realize that what he has to seek is kind of a modus vivendi, which would be acceptable by most parties in Egypt. If not, we're going to have post-evolutionary fluctuations, and that could take years by years. In the process, people will come to understand and to learn what democracy is, how you're going to use the democratic mechanisms. And in the long run, we're going to have something more in lines of an acceptable constitution and political parties would have an idea what their sphere of influence is and what the limitations are. But it would take time. We have to take into account that in the Middle East at large, people did not experience parliamentary politics in the full sense of the word. Egypt has seen parliaments. Egypt is uh, kind of an exception to the rule in a way. But Egypt is also the most or the greatest Arab country in terms of uh, population, in terms of influence, in terms of history. But at this stage, I would stick to what I said before. I think that we are in the midst of a process and we shouldn't look for kind of a democracy the day after because we won't have it. Political parties in Egypt are trying to find out 
what the limitations are or the limits of the power of the other in view of a changing regime and what the regime has in mind when it comes to the people. So this is an ongoing interaction, at times violent, but basically this is all part of the process itself. Thanks for listening to Diwania, conversations on Middle East culture, history, and politics. This episode of Diwania was produced, engineered, and edited by Shoshi Shmulevitz. Diwania is made possible by the support of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies at Tel Aviv University. For more information on the topic of today's show, please visit diwania.org. D-I-W-A-N-I-Y-Y-A dot